Hello. Hey, can you guys hear me at the back? All right, perfect. Um, my name is Vaibhav Shivastav. It's um, it's difficult to pronounce, especially from people in in APAC. So you can call me VB, as in Visual Basic. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna be. I I know this is the session which is just after lunch, so uh, please don't doze off. <laughs> um, we have coffee outside if you want to grab some, and uh, I'm I'm gonna be talking about machine learning with with time series today. Um, just a bit of introduction about myself. I'm based out of India. Uh, specifically from Delhi, um, I work as a data scientist with Deloitte Consulting uh, over there, and predominantly help our Fortune 500 clients to build better data architectures on Google Cloud and other cloud platforms, um, and help them understand uh, how better they can harness the power of machine learning. When I'm not consulting, I am going across APAC for different PyCons. Um, in this year, this is my fifth PyCon. Um, I've in the last month I was at PyCon Korea, then Malaysia, now here in Singapore, and the and the month after I'm going to be in Indonesia. So I'm a, I'm a huge open source fan. I and I and I truly love the power of the community here. Um, with that, um, can we give two minutes for everyone to come in? Sure, sure. Perfect. Okay. Cool. Um, all right. So um, I'm gonna be uh, tweeting out the the slides and the code as well. Um, there would be a code walkthrough, and there would also be slides. Slides would, would would be more about the theory behind time series modeling and how do you actually harness the power of time series. And the code would be how do you actually do uh, all the stuff that we talk about uh, in Python and uh, in a way that you can reproduce that entire workflow for some other other data set. Cool. Uh, is that a fair expectation? Can I get a good yes? yes. Don't sleep off on me, guys. Uh, all right. Uh, if you want to find me on Twitter, I'm at, uh, I'm at reach underscore VB. Um, all my talks are at webof.blog. So if you want to head over there, you can head over there too. Um, before I start, just a quick expectation. I want this to be a, a two-way session. So keep on disturbing me. Just, just, just raise your hand, hands if you have any questions, and uh, we'll take those questions. I don't want it to be like a one-way session where I'm, where I'm just talking, 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 and all of you are sleeping. <laughs> um, all right. So when we talk about time series modeling, one of the first questions that come into play is, what is a time series, right? Um, uh, it is.
happening between um, Europe and Ukraine in general, right? So the, these were these were things which are beyond uh, someone's control. Uh, that's what con constitutes as residual component of a time series. Um, so with that, I'm going to take a quick pause and see if you all have any questions here. Like demonetization. Yeah. Right. So rise or fall. So it will also in the residuals or bias or something. No, it, it so. Um, for everyone, uh, what the gentleman over here is talking about is uh, in India, back in India last to last year, we had uh, demonetization wherein all our money was devalued and new currency was put in into, into the country, which led to uh, pretty much falling of the entire stock market. Um, that in itself is an irregular event. It's not a cyclical event because it, it, it does not happen at non-periodic time. It's not a seasonal event because it does not happen every six months or every two months. So it's an, it's an irregular event. Um, another example of this is the, the 2008 global recession. When the 2008 global recession happened, that was something which, which was not periodic or cyclical or something in nature. It was something which, which, which was an irregularity um, in the environment itself. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Perfect. Yes. So in a given time series, maybe there's some pattern that you observe n number of times. How do you make that cross? Right. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, for everyone, the question is how do you figure out, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, how do you figure out whether um, a pattern is cyclical or is it um, irregular, right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, so the thing is that for anything to be cyclical, you at least need to have one, one variable which is correlated to it, right? So when I'm talking about, uh, let me go back here. When I'm talking about uh, um, the cyclicality of number of cases of measles in Between 1930 to uh, sorry, between 1930 to somewhere between 1930 to 1931. So one spike is one cycle. Um, it's it's just another component within the time series. So number of reported cases were just less in this particular time frame. That's that's pretty much it. It's not like one spike is is one cycle. Uh, so between 1932 and 
the value so if i'm talking about stock prices i want to be able to predict the stock price tomorrow or day after or one month from now for me to be able to make some money um, or save some money and uh, second would be able to um, sort of compare how how accurate my forecast is like get get some sort of confidence in my forecast itself so how do we do that so there are there are to to do that there are two main models that we use um, one is an additive model and the other is a multiplicative model. Uh, now coming to additive model, um, just keep in mind that there are four components we just talked about, right? The observed, the trend, the, the, the cyclical nature and the residual nature, right? The additive model in itself assumes that all these four components are independent of each other. What that means is um, the, the seasonality does not cause the cyclicality or the cyclicality does not cause irregularity the irregularity does not cause something else um, this is how your overall equation when you try to model your time series around it would look like so your um, y which is a function of time would look would, would would essentially be an additive of time component plus the seasonal component plus the cyclical component plus the irregular component so essentially each and every one of these components would make your time series. That's how you model a time series in an additive fashion. In production, when we talk about industry use cases, all the time series prob sorry, all the time series problems are considered as um, as an additive model, and that's how we solve it. Even though there is a multiplicative model, we still try to get all the equations down to or all the time series down to an additive model and then um, run through it. Um, so when do we choose an additive model? Um, when, again, this is kind of something which we covered, but when the behaviors of your components are independent, that is that um, an increase in the trend cycle would not cause an increase in the magnitude of seasonality. So essentially everything should be independent of each other. This is like an ideal scenario. Um, similarly, when, when the difference of your trend and the raw data is roughly constant in similar period of times. So essentially what that means is that because of your trend, your data is not increasing. It's increasing organically. And, and, and we'll, see an, we'll see an example of this in a bit. Um, 
and again the the pattern of your seasonal variation is roughly stable over the year what that means is even if i'm talking about the temperature across an year it's and and if i take an average across uh, across the y axis of that temperature it will still be constant across right and that's what that's what we're talking about over here so your your pattern should should roughly be stable over a year um moving on to the multiplicative model the multiplicative model says it assumes that the component are dependent um okay i'm sorry there's there's a mix up in this slide but essentially this is how the multiplicative model looks like so you you essentially have your um your yt your your overall time series which is basically a multiplicative component of the trend component the seasonal component the cyclical component and the irregular component now something to keep in mind here is um, is, some, is is something which i've written over here uh, let me quickly point out to it so as i as i mentioned right that in the industry even if there is a time series which is um, which which resembles a multiplicative model we still convert it into a into an additive model um what that what that means for us is essentially we have to change that time series from a multiplicative model to an additive model how do we do that is by taking a log transform of it does everyone here know what what a log transform is what, what if one of my number is negative <laughs> that's a uh, that's a good question yeah it it will result in um, in imaginary numbers so what we do is we scale it up to a 0 to 1 scale before doing that um so that you don't have any negative numbers but that's a fantastic question right and again um when do you know whether it is uh, whether it's a multiplicative model that you're looking at the components of the graph would jump in magnitude over time um so all of you who f- who follow bitcoin bitcoin is bitcoin prices are essentially the 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 best example of a multiplicative model the the values just pretty much go here and there right one day it is 18000 us dollars the other day it's 4000 us dollars the the day after it's 19 and like so on and so forth right there is there is no trend to it uh, essentially everything's kind of just going here and there um yeah and 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 the seasonal and the irregular fluctuations are are, are again something which are which which are um kind of a a component of the trend itself so to give you an example the the the, the graph on the left is an additive model the graph on the right is a is a multiplic is a multiplicative model so the the graph on the left dip, depicts the um the the alcohol uh, beverages and tobacco sales in a particular country and uh, you can see essentially they 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 follow a cyclical pattern uh and also a seasonal pattern seasonal pattern because uh whenever you see highs in a particular time series you would see that there is a high because probably that's the holiday season in that particular country in that particular year and then you would like overall in general you'll see that the that the sales are dipping but then the seasonal pattern instills uh is still instilled in the time series um whereas if you see the if you see the multiplicative graph on the other hand that's essentially the internet uh, the international airline passengers um across the world and how they have been increasing as the as the year goes right and you can see that the essentially the trend and the seasonality and the cyclicality everything is increasing as the overall number of passengers are increasing right does that make sense yes no maybe okay i'm going to take that resounding silence as a yes <laughs> um cool so enough about this um enough about um ab- ab- about the boring theory about it um so let me be honest uh, honest here chances are you're not going to be using this theory a lot you're going to be using a code uh, using the code a lot but you would still be bashing your heads a lot when you're going through the trend and the seasonal and the cyclical and the you know the regular component and you try to figure out whether it's an additive model or a multiplicative model that's why i decided to spend uh, about 30 minutes talking about this but the next one r is, is is going to be all about code um so what i want you to do right now um uh, is go to chrome if you don't uh, have internet access there is a way to get internet access using an event code right 
Um, and what you got to do is go to bit.ly slash ml hyphen with hyphen time series. Uh, I'm going to put this up on a notepad for you all. So this is the link, it's bit.ly uh, slash ml hyphen with hyphen time series. I'm going to give you all a minute to get to it. Just raise your hands when you're, when you're there. Uh, yeah so so the event code the event code for you to get access to Wi-Fi is PyCon SG10754 head over there if you aren't and just let me know once you're there on the repo itself Alright, so once you're there, you would find uh, this repo um, which which has uh, all the all the exercises that we'll be going through, all the code that we'll be going through. Can you show the code? Oh yeah, sure. So the repo essentially has uh, has three things. One, how do you do um, exploratory data analysis with a time series data? Uh, and uh, again, the way these these notebooks are built is something where you can pretty much download this this entire notebook. Just change the name of the CSV, and you should be able to repeat the entire workflow for your data, whichever time series data you gotta look into. Um, that's how I've built these these notebooks. So you can you can use them time and again. And all of these notebooks are are in this GitHub repo. So feel free to fork it or feel free to clone it in your own laptops. Uh, while we won't be doing hands-on here, um, so, you know, uh, you can, it's it's always a good idea to have a local copy on your laptops. Or just, just fork it so that you have access to it. Sorry, uh, what is the Wi-Fi? Um... <laughs> it's uh, PyCon SG10754. Guest, guest, guest Wi-Fi. It's guest. Guest app. Guest Wi-Fi. Okay. Yeah. Guest app. Add the rate? Okay, I'm gonna assume that you, you have access now. If you don't have, please bug the people who have access here uh, around the same. Um, now, getting into the, into the repo itself, there are three, uh, three notebooks that you'll see here. One is looking into the data.ipynb. Uh, this particular Jupyter notebook has all the code that you would require for uh, exploratory data analysis with your time series data and to figure out which kind of model is your uh, time series actually following and so on and so forth. Then there is stochastic hyphen model dot IPYNB. Uh, this particular uh, notebook would have pretty much everything that you would need to build a basic model 
uh, using using time series and uh, profit.ipynb is uses this uh, library from facebook and how you can use that to be able to build better and faster time series models so what we're going to do is um, get into look into the data.ipynb and uh, uh, what i would encourage you to do is is open it on your laptops or your phone uh, with me and just go through the code as well i wouldn't be talking about the code in in itself but um, essentially be walking you through how do we actually go through analyzing time series data and feel free to stop me if you have any questions um, right so uh, first things first the data that we're um, that we're looking at over here is essentially the monthly total number of visits into the uk by overseas residents so people who are not residents of uk flying into uk uh, from january 1980 to october 2017 um, that's the data. Um, I'm doing essentially nothing but reading this data into a uh, pandas data frame. As you can see over here, when I uh, see the data in itself, you can see that it's, I essentially have, for, for each and every month, I have a value. Um, so for example, for 1st January 1980, the value was 739. Uh, for the next month, it was 602, 740, and so on and so forth. Essentially, what we're trying to do here is using this, using the number of uh, people that have come into UK um, over the over the months since 1980. We want to build a forecasting model to be able to predict how many number of people would come in in the month after, or how many number of people would come in, say, 2018, how many number of people would come in in 2019, and so on and so forth. Cool. Um, Every, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that everybody's on on this page. If you're not, then you can just follow along with with what I'm doing. Um, just a quick check: Are you all able to see this from the back, or do you want me to to, to zoom in a bit? Okay, let me zoom in then. Is this is this okay? Perfect. Um, now, essentially, what I'm doing is I'm trying to figure out two things. What is through, through the data itself, what is the range of my data? What's the minimum date through which my, my data starts starts from and what's the maximum date? So what's the what's the long and the end of my of my time series? So my start date is 1st January 1980 and the end date is 1st October 2017. And uh, there should be 454 number of months in between and that's, that's how many number of data points I have. Um, now, Let's take a step step back. Uh, why is this important? The reason why this is important is if you have missing data in between uh, for for any of the months, that would mean that essentially your, your your time series would consider that value as zero, right? Which you don't want want actually to be happening. You cannot throw in uh, a time series which has uh, zero variables or null variables within the time series itself. You essentially take a time series which has values populated all throughout and then throw it into a time series model, right? Okay. Now let's let's visualize this this time series in itself. You would see uh, one. There is a cyclical pattern. There is a seasonal pattern, and then there is an overall trend, right? Uh, the the seasonality in the data is essentially the peaks and the troughs. Uh, if you're still figuring out why this is true, it's uh, why there's the seasonal uh, pattern? Then the reason for that is is because um, in the UK, when it's summers, a lot of people go in. When it's winters, a lot of people uh, do not go in. Like like not a lot of people fly in during winters when it's snowing. A lot of people would fly in when it's summer, and you can go around all the places within the UK. Um, that's how there is there is that entire seasonality associated with it, and the and the cyclicality i'm not too sure if you can observe it but this entire trend is is essentially what's what's the cyclical pattern in it and the overall trend is 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 basically upwards which kind of makes sense because a lot of people are crazy about uk and they want to go it uh, go visit it once and uh, this this entire time series intuitively makes sense i'm going to take a quick pause and see if you all have any questions on this Yes, sir. <coughs> One sec. Sorry. 
So um, if I if I take this entire time series and I if I get it down to just one line, which 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 would be like something like this around here, um, the overall cyclical pattern would be this 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 really small trow, right? And then there is another trow, and then there is half of a trow over there. That's the cyclical part. Nobody is nobody is inducing it. Uh, it is it is non periodic as you can see because it's spread across years, and but it's still happening. Does that make sense? Perfect. So what's your target? What's your aim? What are you trying to do? Oh, okay. So um, as I as as I mentioned earlier, this so the the data set itself is how many number of people are coming in per month into the UK, right? So essentially, what I want to do is build a machine learning model. Build a time series forecasting model, which tells me that in the in the next couple of years, how many number of people would come into UK, right? Now, how would it like? Why would an organization do it? Why would the government of UK do it? Would be one to prepare better for uh, the arrivals of these people, and second, if if they expect like a big number of people coming in, they can they can plan accordingly. They can have shows accordingly to increase their tourism, uh, you know, uh, revenue. And they can also be uh, also have more tight security around their borders as well. Does that answer your question? Yes. Cool. Okay. Now, um, now what I'll do is I will I will essentially now if I if I zoom into this entire time series, this is what you'll get. I'm I'm essentially zooming into 2010 and 2012. Uh, the 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 year between 2010 and 2012, and you can see that there there is a pattern here. Irrespective of what kind of pattern it is, there is a pattern that you can see, like a pattern like this, right? And that's that's what we ideally want when when we're looking into a time series. And and again, if you if you just observe this this a bit more, um, and just doing like random exploratory data analysis you would see that um, if 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 you were to decide the best time to go to the go to the uk it would overall it would be basically between uh, march and june um, which is right around here right because a lot of people are going there um, it's it's all sunny as well and that's what the data tells you as well across both the years so in 2010 to 2011 and in 2011 to 2012 as well right um, Okay, now um, we we do you remember that that diagram which I was showing? Uh, the right. So how how do I take that time series which has um, which has like an end to end number of people coming in into UK and so on? How do I break that into these four components? Right, uh, you don't have to uh, like trust me. Python makes it quite quite easy for all of us to do this. Um, so essentially, you just have to use this one library. It's called Stats Models. You can use this library to uh, use this function called Seasonal Decompose within it, and uh, and essentially get the trend component, the seasonal component, and the cyclical component of your um, of your time series. And this is this is super super helpful. Why? Because uh, one, this uh, one, this helps you helps you helps you extract all of these features from your time series. Um, and second, it can essentially put it into a pandas data frame for you to then do modeling on, right? Um, so the the code itself is is, is is quite simple. You have to give a frequency. So um, if you're dealing with quarterly data, you would essentially change twelve to four. If you're dealing with daily data, you would change 12 to 365, um, and you essentially have to give a model here, uh, whether the model is additive or multiplicative, and uh, then you basically call the function uh, seasonal decompose, and you provide the period to it, and you provide the frequency to it, you, you provide the model to it, and it will essentially give you the trend, the seasonal and the residual component. The fourth one is, is observed, which we already saw, right? Now let's 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 um, dive deep into the trend component here. The trend component looks like this. 
um, which is which is kind of a no-brainer because that's what we also observed. But essentially, now you have this value in a in a in a data frame for you to model on. Um, similarly, let's look at the seasonality. This is how the seasonality is. People come in when it's hot. People uh, kind of uh, the number of people decrease um, severely when it's when it's winters or about to be winters and so on. Um, and again, like if I if I if I look at the seasonality um, of this of this time series, it would look like this. It pretty much follows the the graph which we made earlier, which was the actuals of 2010 to 2012, right? So that's 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 kind of the best part. Now you know that your that your data works quite well, right? You know that your data follows all the time series. Uh, patterns that it should it is good good for you to model now the only thing left for you to do is to figure out which which time series model would you use that's what we're going to jump to next um, i'm going to take a quick pause here and see if you have any questions on all all the code that we covered just yet yes sir no it's 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 essentially a bunch of statistical rules um, which we in general use to so so for example uh, when I'm when I'm transforming from multiplicative to additive what it's doing is it's it's doing a log transform right when I'm trying to find the trend it will essentially look at the slope of your entire time series calculate it o over a period of time and uh, give you the line following that so it's it's not a machine learning model running behind it's a, it's essentially a bunch of uh, maths and differentiation equations which are written which execute and they give the answer to you does that make sense no yes no okay so let's let's deep dive into it in angular Okay, I'm not able to find the find the exact mathematical formula for it, but um, I <coughs> I have a book for it. So um, how how about we park that question till the end of the um, session, and I can I can show you that. Cool, perfect. <coughs> All right. Um, any other questions? Yes. Um, so if I if I got it right, your question is how do you decide whether a problem is a time series problem or not? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, it's actually quite simple. You should have uh, data which is periodic in nature, and 
as as less missing values as possible spread across at least 3 to 4 years uh and and you cannot have a time series wherein you have data for one month in a year and then three months in the next year and then four months in the in the year after it should be continuous that's that's when you can do that that's one of the requirements does that answer your question So you're saying that for the same month, if you have multiple values, yeah, maybe for, the same date. <clears throat> for the same date, you can do a couple of things, right? You can you can take an average of that entire date, uh, what, whatever value you have you have for that entire day, you can take an average of it, or you can just take the first month or the last month. Essentially, like whatever you'll do, you'll do it for all the dates in in your entire time series, right? So you can take an average, you can take the mean of it, you can you you, you can take so median. Yeah, yeah. Does that answer your question? Cool, perfect. All right, so now that we know how do we extract all these individual components out of my time series, let's 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 get to how do we actually build a machine learning model around it, right? Um, and and more specifically, what type of models should one use? All right, so. Um, when it comes to what what models you should use, one, one of the widely used machine learning models or time series models in the industry is an is an ARMA model. It's nothing but it's it's an auto regressive moving average model, and uh, this essentially assumes that your data is a stationary uh, stationary process. I'll, I'll I'll come to what a stationary process is. But uh, if, if say tomorrow you were thinking of applying ARIMA on your or ARMA model on your data, there are two, two tests that we run for it. One's an ADF, it's an augmented Dickey Fuller test and a KPSS test, the full forms too, uh, too difficult for pronounce for at least for me. So I'm just gonna say KPSS um, test. And you can essentially run these tests using the stats models library itself uh, to be able to figure out whether um, an ARMA model would fit for your time series or not. Now let's let's dive a bit more deep into autoregressive and moving averages process. I'm not going to spend too much time on this but um, uh, essentially it's just good to know what is a long memory, what is a short memory within 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 ARMA. So autoregressive process are, are essentially long memory processes. They, they essentially look at the overall trend of your entire time series. So if I'm talking about uh, stock prices for uh, Snapchat, uh, the overall trend would be like a decreasing trend, right? They started off at like $40, then they're now at like 10, 11 or 12 and so on, right? Or similarly for Google spread uh, spread across past five years, it will be like a, um, it will be like an overall increasing trend there. And uh, then comes the MA, which is the moving average part. It's essentially a short term uh, memory. It's, 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 a, it's a very small, uh, it's, it's essentially the trend that you see in a, in a, in a very small interval of the period. So uh, say for example, how, how much did the stock price change from this month to the other month? Uh, a simple example of this is every time you see, uh, every time Google or Facebook has their uh, quarterly um, earnings call, you would see either the in that short term either the price of the stock would would increase rapidly um, that is if if you have um, uh, if they met their goals or it would decrease uh, rapidly again if they did if it did not meet their goals okay now um, i mentioned this this uh, earlier um, it, there is like arma is is the math behind how the how the models work the the model that we actually use out there is an arima model uh, and it 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 essentially takes uh, takes in your takes in your data even if it is non stationary and we'll get to what stationary and non stationary time series are in a bit but um, essentially take take a time series which is uh, which is not easily modelable take that and model it and give you forecast for it uh, just a quick thing, ARIMA model only only models the trend component 
and the residual component. It does not model the seasonal component at all. So if you have seasonal component in your data, it will pretty much ignore it and it, and it would only look for the trend in your time series. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so with, with that, there is another variation of ARIMA. It's called SARIMA. It's seasonal ARIMA, which actually figures out how to how to also take seasonal parameters into it. So don't get bogged down with, with what's written there uh, on the slides. Essentially, what you need to know is, uh, is an ARIMA model takes, is, is essentially works on two principles. One is an autoregressive principle and the other is a moving average principle. The autoregressive principle looks at the entire time series and sees what the overall trend is in the entire time series. And the moving average would see between a period. So a period being a month, a day, or um, you know, uh, or, or a year, or a quarter, and so on, right? And another thing to remember, another quick takeaway from here is that ARIMA model does not model a seasonal component. It only models the trend and the residual component. And uh, if you want to model the seasonal component, there is another variation of ARIMA. It's called SARIMA. It's S-A-R-I-M-A, which also models a seasonal component. And okay, uh, so. Taking, taking all that we have we have checked till now or all that we've covered till now um, essentially the rough framework for doing time series modeling is that one you check whether you you look at the time series itself and you see uh, if, if there is a trend or a seasonal effect in the time series itself right uh, second is that you check the stationarization uh, by taking differences we're just gonna do it with code um, in two minutes and then you check for seasonality and then you model the entire time series essentially that right so um, all that pre-processing all the eda sort of comes into this particular stage of the time series modeling now let's get back into uh, the repo itself and uh, what what i essentially want you all to do is is open this notebook it's the stochastic hyphen models dot ip by nb notebook I'm gonna give you a minute to be there. All right, so essentially we use the same data set here. Um, the data set still remains the same. It's, it's, uh, it is about the number of people coming into UK uh, monthly and um, we do the same thing we load this into a into a pandas data frame and um, again so what we're what there's another principle that that comes into this we essentially train the entire model on a training set and we test it so we have to figure out how how good the model is right so we essentially divide the entire time series into two components the one is a one is a train component which which for us would be from 1983 all the way till uh, 2014 and the testing would be from 2014 to all the way till 2017 right so essentially I've, I've divided the two i'll build my model on on the training set and then i'll test it on the testing set to be able to see how how accurate my model is and what best it can do now now we we spoke about this this thing about stationarity of a of a time series so whether a uh, whether a time series is stationary or not uh, is is essentially if if a, if a time series is non-stationary it will show seasonal effects trends and other uh, other other things which are dependent on um, on on time right essentially you want things which are independent of time to be able to model it so you don't want something which is correlated with the time so for example when you're trying to model um, a typical, uh, a typical use case of lifts. You would see that the number of calls a lift gets would be a lot high during morning when people get in, um, and would be a lot high when when people get in for lunch or like go down for lunch or are getting out of work, right? So you don't want like ideally it's a it's a, it's a good time series, but you don't want something which is dependent on the time itself, right? And and the and the way to check that is uh, is actually quite simple. Um, using using stats models but before we get to it we need to make sure um, that we're able to seasonally decompose the entire time series again and see how it how it looks like 
so again this is something which we covered um, in the previous CDA so I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna uh, show it up to you real quick and you can see that that, that the observed time series is is all across from 1983 to, to 2007 and the trend is overall increasing there's a seasonal pattern and the residual um, now we spoke about these these two tests one was an augmented Dickey Fuller uh, test and one was a KPSS test uh, essentially if the if the ADF if the result that ADF gives you is um, is more than 0 0.05 sorry 0 0.5 then it means that it is something that cannot be modeled with an ARIMA model so and and similarly for for KPSS as well um, uh, don't worry if you're not um, if you're not understanding how to interpret the results I've put in in the in the notebook itself how to interpret these results and there are functions as well which kind of tell you just by looking into the time series itself whether you can model a particular uh, a particular time series using um, this particular time series so you can see that one I, once I run the uh, once I run the ADF and the KPSS test uh, essentially both of them are bo both of them are um, uh, for a significance level of 5.0 both of them say that that you cannot run uh, run an ARIMA model on it that's because the the time series in itself is not stationary what that means is that the time series is um, is dependent on the time as well so we have to decouple that um, the way we do that is this so there's there's this whole concept of um, of rolling statistics statistics sorry um, which essentially what what it would do is it would it would find these three things one it would take the overall if you look here the overall seasonal component and it will take the standard deviation of that so essentially uh, it generally the generally the standard deviation itself should be like a straight line spread across the time series and uh, it would look at the overall mean of the data itself uh, over the over the time period ideally if your if your time series is is stationary both of these lines should coincide with each other so essentially they should be plain like this so red line and then the blue line should essentially um, have a unit dif difference between the two but essentially should follow like a constant pattern right that's how you know that that this data that this data is not stationary so now let's make this stationary how we how we do stationarization is essentially by using box box transformation um, um, it essentially helps you uh, remove the irregularity and and make the entire time series stationary um, again there's you don't have to do a lot for this there is another library called scipy and within scipy within the stats module there is a box box transformation already present in it and uh, we can essentially put in that value and uh, and put into and and you know model our time series accordingly um, then we do this after the entire thing uh, after i'm done with the with the entire box cox transformation you will see that both my standard deviation of the of the rolling statistics and the mean of the rolling statistics are kind of in line to each other right uh, so there is the the red line and the and the blue line pretty much follows the same pattern and they are in sync with the baseline this is where you ideally want want it to be at as well when you have this then you know that that you can put in like an arima model or or any other model and be able to build uh, a time series forecast for it and um, leave this part then we we, we essentially use stats model uh, and get into uh, and, and build a Sarimax model out of it again Sarimax is is nothing but seasonal ARIMA uh, ARIMA model and once you build it you can you can essentially get um, it will build you the model it will give you certain summary statistics around what is the p-value of it what is the coefficient what is the standard error and so on and uh, then you can essentially do something like predict uh, for the test set so for example in in our case we trained on the train set which was still 2014 and then we uh, we have a testing set for which we already know the actual values for right so i know that from 2014 to 2017 the values were either 900 700 400 500 something like that and then i can easily compare 
the two values to see how how accurate my model is and uh, this is essentially what it is so if you look in this graph the predicted is the dark blue line and the observed or, or the real ones for from 2014 all the way till 2017 um, are the light blue lines right and, and and you can see that our model actually did like a pretty good job in um, in being able to figure out or in, in, in being able to forecast from 2014 all the way till 2017. And yeah, and, and then you can do all kinds of things like what is the confidence interval around this. So confidence interval would say that for a given point of time, how high or low a particular value can be in, in what particular range. So for example, when I'm talking about October 2015, um, the value is roughly about 2000, but it can go all the way up till 3000 and can kick it towards the, lower, towards the lower end, can be towards, uh, you know, 1500 and stuff like that. So that that's your maximum and, and minimum upper range. So when you're like forecasting something, you can essentially have uh, like a forecasted value. You can see what's the maximum deviation. You can see what's the minimum deviation and you can see the average that you're seeing on the graph itself. So that, that way it's, it's kind of uh, really helpful. And then again, we can, we can, we can, there are multiple ways to evaluate a particular time series. There is uh, MAPE values, there are um, uh, R2 values, there are U values. All of these are, are, are different, different values depending upon your error metric. Uh, the, the most used one is mean squared error. So essentially how, how far off is your forecast from the actual value itself? You, you, you take that error and you square it off across all the data points. And yeah, and, and like once you, once you do that, you can essentially um, figure out how, how, how good or bad your, your uh, mean squared error or, or like your, your forecast is. In this scenario, the, the forecast in itself is, is pretty aligned with how your actual values are. Uh, ideally, that's how you want it to be like. And uh, again, just a, just a quick heads up, um, if you go through to the top of this notebook in itself, you can essentially, all you, all you have to do is just um, change the read underscore CSV, like change the path of the file itself, right? Provide a new CSV, this can be for um, a stop that you've been following, this can be for weather, this can be for pretty much anything. And then just run the entire notebook all over again and build a time series model using Arima. Um, that's the kind of uh, power of this entire notebook. And uh, second, you can you, you can look into the look into the data.ipynb file and uh, be able to do uh, proper exploratory data analysis for it. Now, before I uh, before I close off the session, there is one more thing which I want you to know about, and this is something which which Facebook research has has come up with. It's called uh, Profit. Profit is is a library which Facebook has built, and uh, it's specifically for time series modeling in itself. And um, it's it's super super uh, intuitive. What it does is is essentially you don't have to do all that we spoke about right now. You don't have to do stationarization. You don't have to do box cost uh, transformation. You really do not have to look at the trend, the seasonal, or whatever component um, that that you were looking at. All you have to do is is just essentially import FB profit um, and just create a create a profit object, fit the model, and you get the results. Um, at the back end, it will figure out whether it is an additive model, whether it's a multiplicative model, whether you're supposed to do a log transformation or not, whether you're supposed to, um, you know, stationarize the entire time series. It will do all of that because it's it's already programmed to do all of that and then run roughly about eight to 10 different models, include, including some of neural network models and uh, then select the best one and give you the results for it. So. Uh, but I wouldn't recommend you to you using this just yet. Uh, I would recommend you going through the uh, the old boring route first. Figure out how your time series is like. Understand the nuances within the time series, and then throw it at at profit. Uh, for those of you who are, who are planning on deploying these models in production, profit is very good for production deployments as well. It can handle millions of requests per second as well. So it's it's fairly scalable. So you don't have to worry about all of those things as well. Um, 
within the within the uh, repo itself there is a profit.ipy nb notebook which takes takes in the same data say uh, t takes in the same uk visits data and actually applies um, um, the the profit model to it and you can see uh, i'm this is how i'm defining it um, i'm importing profit and uh, I, I i define the the date columns and there are certain parameters for it which which you may or may not want to put in you can like remove all of these and just fit the fit, fit the model as well but if you're sure of um, what kind of growth pattern you're looking at is it a linear model or and so on and so forth you can put that and essentially make a prediction out of it and yeah it it, it gives you these these pretty graphs for example the overall trend of your forecast is like this then um, you know uh, it will since it is a it is a time series it will it will also take into consideration the holidays that are there and also model it uh, with itself which in in our scenario we'll have to do it manually you'll have to like figure out which of the dates or which of the months have holidays to be able to factor that in additionally so it does that by default and yeah it's it's uh, it's pretty sweet and and you can you can essentially compare your forecast as we did last time around um, with with profit as well um, and you can see uh, last time around the since since it was like a carefully manually done forecast it was quite close to the observed values but for for Facebook profit it is not as close but it's 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 still much more close than um, than before and yeah you, you can you can do the same things again and get the get the values for it so with that I'm gonna take a pause and uh, I'm going to say thank you. Uh, thank you so much for listening through my entire talk. Uh, should you have any questions, I can take it up right now or I can take it outside. Uh, uh, and just just a quick uh, just a quick thing. Uh, I, I will be tweeting out the slides later on. I'm available at reach underscore VB. Um, and I'll I'll also be uh, posting the link to this to this uh, repo. If you if you're interested in contributing to the repo and, and adding more methods into it, just shoot out a note to me and um, I'll add you as a collaborator and you can add stuff but I would recommend you going back today and you know trying a couple of time series models today and you know if you if you find something cool do let me know so thank you questions is there a way to automatically label uh, the start and the end of a cycle the start and the end of a cycle yes. uh, mm -hmm. Compose, uh, you check the, uh, the cycle, cyc uh, cyclic components, right? Yeah, yeah. So there are many cycles in the chart. So is there a way to automatically label uh, start and end? Not, not right now. Um, generally, how we, how we go about doing that is looking at the time series in itself and then tagging those points manually. So, yeah. Yeah, at what point do you, would you say that uh, uh, your data is not reliable enough to do predictions? It's too irregular. It's too irregular, right. So... There's some number that tells you, oh no, I should Yeah, I, I, I wish there was one. Um, but to be honest, it's, it's, a, it's a mix of uh, how the time series itself, right. So one is that when you look at the time series itself, if you see that it is following some sort of a multiplicative uh, you know trend right for example how Bitcoin prices are right so like if if even visually you're not able to figure out whether there is like a trend right um, then then you essentially decompose that entire times uh, that time series right and you would see that there are ups and downs and if, if you don't see like a proper trend coming in that is when you typically know that you cannot model this time series um, but there is no hard and fast number as such that you know if, if 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 this particular function gives you a number above five then you should not model it there's there's nothing like that it's 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 more of like you know trying and testing and and so on because more often than not so so for example for bitcoin right you would think that you cannot model it using a time series but turns out you you actually can if you take a log transform of of entire bitcoin series and if you then model it you you should be get getting some reliable results but um, again, there's there's like a very strong irregular component when when it comes to bitcoins because of you know the fear uncertainty and you know all of that. But yeah, long story short, you you have to like visually and through uh, ADF, KPSS, and log transform test figure out figure that out. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Okay.
Tic-tac. I have two questions. Uh, so the first one, I think you kind of just mentioned it, but so there's no mathematical way to determine whether it's an additive or multiplicative. Right. So um, there is um, there is actually a way to figure that out. Um, but but generally you can you, you can just take the seasonal component, right, and the trend component, um, and the cyclical component. You you have these three components in a pandas data frame, and you can see the correlation between the three. If it's something which is highly correlated, then you know that it is a multiplicative uh, model, right? If it's not correlated, then you know that it, it is an additive model. And should should it be correlated, then you can take a log transform of it and make it non-correlated and make an additive model. Um, I was wondering if you have any experience working with LSTMs for uh, time series forecasting and how that uh, contrasts with arena models in performance. Right, so uh, we, we actually have worked with it and, and in fact there is a notebook uh, which I'm going to push in today which, which, which tells how to do LSTFs. Uh, ideally this was meant for like a workshop uh, but I had to squeeze it in for a talk. Um, so I have worked with, with LSTFs, long short term memory networks. It is quite good. Uh, the, the only problem that comes with LSTFs is the interpretability itself and the fact that it can overfit to the sequence is quite uh, quite easily and especially like so just think of it this way right when you're dealing with neural networks the more dimensionality you have the the, the better it is for you right but when it comes to time series at, at best you would have four dimensions to it right so it, it generally overfits towards a trend and would almost always give you like a upward going trend or a downward going trend and not give you the on, and not capture the certain nuances of um, of uh, the seasonality and uh, second it works quite well when you have say 20 years of data or 25 years of data but if you only have five or six years of data then yeah it, it would pretty much give you trashy results does that answer your question cool yes in this case we are super fortunate because we have a complete data but in the reality, somehow we have a lot of missing data. How yeah. do you deal with that? Ah, that's a that's a fantastic question. So, um, say for example, we're talking about rainfall um, in Singapore, and you don't have the data for June, right? And you're talking about five years worth of data, for example. So, what you can do is is couple of things. You can replace this year's June's data with last year's June's data, or you can take an average of all the all the last time periods for that particular variation, take an average of it and then replace it with that. Um, or you can replace it with the with the value before it. You can reduce it, uh, replace it with the average of the entire year. You can do pretty much anything there. Um, but bottom line being is that you will have to impute it. So, so yeah. So. What if the imputation by forecasting the missing value itself? What if uh, we impute the value by, uh -huh. by forecast using the previous data? You, you, you can, you, you absolutely can. Uh, the only condition there is that you should at least have more than three years worth of data before. So if, if say your time series is from 2016 till 2019, and if you have missing data in 2016 itself, then you cannot forecast it, right? Then you'll, you'll, you, because you don't have data for 2015. So uh, you could have done what you're saying if you had missing value in 2019. So you could have trained a model to 2018, forecast it for 2019, replace that value over there, and then train another model from uh, 2016 all the way to 2019. One more question. Uh, from the school uh, model that you present today, uh, how to pick the best evolution metrics? Because uh, we have two different profit and the uh, RMA model, but we don't know which one is the best for this case. So how do, how do we pick the best evolution metric for that case or another case? Right, I, I think I have this in the slides. One sec. Oh, I don't. Um, you can use something called uh, you you can calculate something called mean absolute percentage error the lower the mean absolute percentage error for your model is the better it is this is present in scikit learn by default and uh, essentially that's how you define your your uh, log or, or your error metric, right? So the lower the MAPE is, the better it is, uh, the better your model is. 
So if the the Arma model is not working, you try the Sarima model. If the Sarima model is not working, you try Profit. Profit is not working, you try LSTMs. If that's not working, uh, just throw the problem away and <laughs> go to another one. Uh, yeah. Does that answer your question? Good, perfect. Do we have any other questions? Yes, sir. Yes, hi. Um, my question is actually regarding your data set about the um, arrival, air travelers arrival in the UK. So um, I believe Facebook's profit um, model, you imported the holidays uh, as a, some sort of component, right? Yeah. Um, is there a way to model, to have the model actually predict accurately um, the values on the holidays itself? Um, no, because uh, your, your your data is on a monthly scale, right? So should you have had the data on a daily scale, you could have done that. But uh, if, you, if, if you have it on a monthly sc uh, scale, then it will eventually give you like an average of that monthly value spread across each and every day uh, in the month, right? So it won't be able to do that. So um, if my data is on a final resolution, um, there is a way. Yeah, 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 yeah. If 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 your if your granularity is more finer than monthly, then you can essentially do that, right? So, for example, if I take daily stock data for past thirty years, right, and then I can essentially predict that what, what what's going to be the price tomorrow, a day after tomorrow, and so on. But say I have even more finer data, which gives me hourly stock price data, then I can essentially predict what would be the price of the stock in the in in the in the next hour, and so on. So depends upon what gra what granularity are you modeling your um, data on. Generally, the finer the better, because you have much more information that way. So if I'm just trying to clarification. So uh, let's say for daily stock data, right? Let's say you have um, hourly price, okay, the last traded price. Um, you would be modeling only a twenty-four hour period, right? Rather than any data spread longer than a day. Can you repeat that real quick? So um, let's say I'm modeling um, hourly stock price. Uh -huh. okay. um, <coughs> the period that you cover would only be the start of the trading day and the, to the end of the trading day. Is that correct? Um, yeah, because like your your stock packet opens from 9 to 5, right? So it will basically be for every day from 9 to 5. Mm. It won't be for 24 hours because after five, the stock price would be constant all the way till next day is nine. So there's no point modeling it, right? So you just take it from nine to five. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. No problem. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. To an earlier question, you mentioned you had a book recommendation for this topic. Yeah. Thank you for asking that question. I totally forgot about it. Um, if you go towards the README, um, the README has, has a lot of information about how to set up your environment to do this. Um, it also has a lot of information about the data set and the models and where you can know more about the packages that I've used. And also there's this entire README section, which has which is like heavily linked with, with links. This is the book I was talking about, Time Series by A.W. Van der Waart. Um, it, it pretty much walks you through the math behind Time Series modeling, if you're interested in that. And uh, there are a lot more books, in fact, um, to answer your question, there was a question about LSTMs. So there is this really nice blog from um, Machine Learning Mastery um, about how do you use LSTMs, the pitfalls in LSTMs, and how do you actually debug those and uh, help build better forecasting models. Does that answer your question? Yes, and I guess specifically, I'm very interested to learn, I don't have a background in that series, but I'm interested to learn more about the part that you skip because of time reasons, uh, the determining of the PDQ uh, coefficient. Right, yeah. Whatever. I guess that's in the... That's, so it's it's in both. It's uh, also in the, in the notebook itself. If you go through the notebook, it'll tell you about what is the PDQ. They're essentially the lag values. So if I take a lag of six months, one year, and so on, it'll, it'll tell you about that. And uh, that's that's one. Second is uh, this book by Time Series, uh, Time Series by A.W. Van der Waart. Uh, it'll help you do that. Um, though a quick heads up, in industry uh, there are now quite a lot of functions to give you PDQ value um, by default. So they essentially try all the PDQ values and give you the best one. So you can you can you can use that too. Perfect. All right. Any other questions?
cool in that case thank you so much for listening in um, and I, I i hope you have a great rest of the day and if you have any questions i'll be around today tomorrow and the day after feel free to ping me or uh, tweet out at reach underscore vp thank you so much